Hello everyone, this is Miss A.G., Library Assistant at Ruby Young Elementary. I have a really fun book today that I'm going to be reading to you with permission from Henry Holt and Company. The title is Pass, Go, and Collect $200. The real story of how Monopoly was invented. Now Monopoly is one of my favorite board games and I trust it's a lot of y'all's favorite board games as well. It is written by Tanya Lee Stone and illustrated by Stephen Salerno. And here's the cover of the book. What kind of Monopoly player are you? Do you save your money until you land on Park Place or Boardwalk? Do you buy up all the properties you can? Do you always want to be the banker? Do you and your friends like to make the game last for days or find ways to play a shorter game? Monopoly is one of the most famous games in the world. More than 1 billion people have played it in 111 countries. 1 billion. Monopoly is really about making and losing money. The person with the most money and property at the end of the game wins. Have you ever wondered who invented Monopoly? Or how rich and famous that person became? Was the inventor of Monopoly the ultimate winner? We need to look back more than a hundred years to find out. Here's the pictures. Elizabeth Maggie, or Lizzie as she was called, was a woman of many talents. She was smart, made people laugh easily, wrote poetry and short stories, and enjoyed acting. Sometimes Lizzie would dress in a costume, knock on her own door, and trick her husband into thinking she was someone else. She wasn't afraid to speak her mind publicly either, which was brave behavior for a woman at the time. Perhaps the most important thing about Lizzie Maggie, though, was that she took issues of fairness quite seriously. And Lizzie Maggie was born in 1866 and died in 1948. And here's a, uh, let me go this way. Here's a picture. In the late 1800s, Millions of Americans left small towns and farming areas to move to cities where workers were needed more than ever before. Of course, they had to have places to live. A small number of wealthy people began to buy as much land as they could and build houses and apartment buildings. They charged people fees or rent to live there. The more land the owners controlled, the higher the rent increased. This creates a situation in which the landlords could become wealthier than renters or tenants. I'm sorry, while renters or tenants stayed poor. And this is a depiction of the landlord. Lizzie thought this was a terrible arrangement, but it gave her a great idea. She created a game to show people how unjust this landlord-tenant relationship could be. The winner was a player with the most land and money at the end of the game. The other players usually went broke in the process. Lizzie also came up with a second set of rules to show a fair way to play, which had players sharing money when it was earned. She likely knew that the first, more competitive way to play would be more popular. She compl complicated her her complicated game was designed for grown-ups, but she believed kids were smart enough to play too. Lizzie hoped kids would see just how unfair the first set of rules was and grow up to play by the second set in real life. Lizzie Maggie called it the landlord's game. And in 1903, she filed a patent to claim credit for her invention. Lizzie's patent detailed her game rules and included a drawing of the board and its pieces. 
It was the first time anyone had ever filed a patent for a board game. The patent was granted in January 1904 at a time when women received fewer than 1% of all U.S. patents. And there she is. To play her game, Lizzie used dice, a bank with play money, and two kinds of cards, luxury and legacy, that a player might draw during a turn. She had four railroads, one placed in the middle of each side of the board. There were 22 properties, or lots, each with a purchase price and a rent value. Any player landed on a lot owned by another player had to pay rent. Three of the corners of Lizzie's board were labeled public park, go to jail, and jail. Players who went to jail had to pay a fine or stay there until they rolled doubles. The fourth corner of Lizzie's board was called Mother Earth. Each time players passed Mother Earth, complimenting one turn around the board, they collected $100. Does any of this sound familiar? So what you're seeing now is a picture of her original board. Lizzie Maggie improved her game, designing a new board in 1906. She and two friends manufactured a small number of them. Lizzie added more, some more new rules, including charging more rent for owning multiple railroads. Fans of the game also started using handmade boards. Pretty soon, lots of people were playing her game. One of them was a man named Scott Nearing. He taught business at the University of Pennsylvania and took Lizzie's game to class to teach his students about landlords and rent. He and his students loved the game. They started calling it monopoly because that's the term used when an owner gains sole control over a group of properties. The students made replicas of the game. They shared them with other students at other colleges. The landlord's game was probably the most complex game of its time, but people enjoyed it as its many ideas and rules. Word spread, and soon more and more people were playing Lizzie Maggie's game, although most didn't know it was her idea. Do you ever change the rules when you play Monopoly with your friends? Well, that was what's happening with Lizzie's game. It became common for people to make their own boards, often adding local street names and tweak the rules to their liking. And the definition of a monopoly is the exclusive possession or control of the supply or trade of a commodity or service. So that shows up. The definition of monopoly, and then you see some people playing. In 1909, Lizzie Maggie showed her board game to George Parker. George and his two brothers owned the Parker Brothers Game Company. They admired her game, but they thought it was too challenging and educational. They turned her down. She made more changes and tried to sell her game to the Parker Brothers again, but they still weren't interested. In 1924, Lizzie renewed her patent. This time, she added a rule that allowed a player to own all railroads or utilities to double the rent. And her improvements rule allowed players to add houses to their property, increasing the rent. So this shows rules, but here's a picture, a depiction of the, par of the Parker Brothers here. None of this stopped Lizzie's game from continuing to attract new players. Devoted fans kept making their own changes. The most lasting changes 
happened in Atlantic City, New Jersey in 1930. Ruth Hoskins, a young Quaker teacher, and her friends renamed most of the properties after Atlantic City streets and neighborhoods. They were inspired by locations such as, such as St. Charles Place, Vit, Vintnor Avenue, and Boardwalk. Someone else came up with color sequences and dividing the properties into groups of three. Atlantic City players added hotels to the game as well. Around this time, a huge financial crisis called the Great Depression struck. All across the country, companies and farms went out of business. People had trouble paying for everything from food to rent. In, by 1932, one in four Americans had lost their jobs. One of them was a man named Charles Darrow. That's kind of a picture of Charles Darrow. And then you see the folks walking on the boardwalk in Atlantic City. He and his wife, meaning Charles Darrow, had dinner with friends who happened to have an Atlantic City game board. They taught the Darrows how to play. Charles loved the game and decided to make his own board. He asked his friends for copies of their rules. You know how some people have a knack for asking some, for taking something great and making it even better? Well, that's what Charles Darrow did. The first board he made was round. Although he quickly went back to the idea of a square board, the round one had inspired Charles to draw larger rectangles with bars of color on the top, one for each group of properties. He also created new designs with the help of stencils. For the chance question marks, the waterworks faucet, the electric company light bulb, and the railroad trains. Here was another big change. Instead of sharing a game freely, like most others had done, Charles started selling sets to friends. Nearly broke, he thought it might be a good way to earn money for his family. He made each one by hand, drawing the game board on a large piece of oil cloth with pen and ink and using oil paint for the colored brands, bands. He cut straps of wood into houses and hotels and painted those too. He also typed up the rules. Each game took about eight hours to make. Soon, Charles Darrow advertised his version, claiming credit as his inventor. This just shows him and his wife making board games. With some of the profits he made from selling his sets, Charles paid to have 500 game boards made by a small local printing firm. He asked a cartoonist friend, Franklin Alexander, to help him improve the look of the game. Franklin added illustrations, such as the go to jail police officer and Jake the jailbird, the man behind the bars. Charles Dar Darrow's colorful board made Monopoly look more dynamic than ever. The 1934 board looks much like the one we know today. On the box, it simply said Monopoly. Charles tried to sell the game to two companies, one of which was Parker Brothers. He was turned down, just like Lizzie. But Charles did not give up. He persuaded a big department store and a famous toy store to stock his Monopoly sets for Christmas. Pretty soon, other stores signed on. 
And you can see the displays in the windows. Parker Brothers heard that Charles Darrell's Monopoly game was quickly becoming a big hit. It was selling so well that the no Parker Brothers had given him before was about to con turn into a yes. Charles signed a contract with Parker Brothers that included naming him as the game's inventor. Uh-oh, trouble? You know that Charles didn't invent Monopoly. Lizzie McGee did. You also know that others made changes to her game as it was passed from community to community across the country. But Charles Darrow's round of changes, his success in selling it, and the new attitude at Parker Brothers finally made the company give Monopoly a chance. To protect anyone from copying it, Parker Brothers needed a patent. Can you guess what happened next? Parker Brothers discovered Lizzie McGee's patent. Patent. George Parker then remembered Lizzie tried to sell him her game years before. After having an earlier claim that Monopoly was his brainchild, Charles Darrow admitted he had worked from an existing game, but he didn't know who created it. So we have the Battle of the Inventors. Parker Brothers had a big problem. The company needed to own Lizzie's patent to be able to sell Monopoly. In November 1935, George Parker traveled by train to Lizzie's home to talk with her. He offered her $500, the equivalent of almost $9,000 today, and promised to publish her original landlord's game, as well as two other games she had also invented. Lizzie McGee agreed, and on the last day of December, more than 30 years after she first invented her board game, Parker Brothers owned all the rights to Monopoly. Charles Darrow was about to become a millionaire. Wait, what about Lizzie? Charles was going to make millions, and she was only getting $500? The whole reason she invented the landlord's game was to show how unfair money issues can become when someone takes sole control over property. At first, Lizzie McGee was content with the deal she struck because her ideas would finally reach a mass audience. But she didn't stay content. When Lizzie saw Monopoly for sale in 1936, with Charles Darrow named at his its inventor, she was shocked and furious. And she wasn't the only one. Many of the players who added to the game before Charles came along were also upset. Lizzie McGee didn't hesitate to talk to reporters at the Washington Post. Although the paper ran a story about Lizzie being the original inventor, the news of her claim eventually faded. Darrow getting away with millions while Lizzie was only getting $500. Today, we know that without Lizzie McGee, there likely never would have been a game called Monopoly for us to play and love. Her initial idea is the heart of the game. And without Charles Darrow, Monopoly may not have become America's favorite board game. All the other folks who added to their ideas along the way helped make it great too. So who wins in this story? What do you think? Did Lizzie McGee make a wrong move? Did Charles Darrow? How would you have played it? In any case, 
There is no doubt that millions of people all over the world adore Monopoly. There's our millionaire. All right, that's the end of our story, but I do have some trivia that I'd like to share with you. And it's, this page is entitled Tremendous Trivia. Lizzie McGee also invented a device that helped paper move more easily through typewriter rollers in 1893. That's when she learned how to file a patent. During World War II, tokens were made of wood because metal was needed for the war effort. In the 1970s, a braille version of Monopoly was made for the visually impaired. People of all ages love Monopoly. A younger version, Monopoly Junior, was introduced in 1990. Charles and Olive Todd were the friends who taught Charles Darrow how to play Lizzie's game. The Todds misspelled Atlantic City's real life suburb, Marvin, M A R V E N, Gardens on the board they made, spelling it M-A-R-V-I-N, Gardens. Darrow copied that misspelling and it, was, and it has never been corrected. In 1995, Hasbro, the company that bought Parker Brothers in 1991, apologized to the residents of Marvin Gardens. Darrow had players use their own tokens, such as charms from girls' bracelets or Cracker Jack boxes. Parker Brothers introduced the metal tokens with their games. The longest Monopoly game ever played lasted 1,680 hours. That's 70 days. The character we now call Mr. Monopoly had the name Rich Uncle Pennybags until 1999 and was modeled after famous financier J.P. Morgan. Parker Brothers made Darrow the offer to buy Monopoly in the historic Flatiron building in New York City. Coincidentally, the Flatiron is also where this book was edited and published. A worldwide Save Your Token campaign on Facebook in 2013 resulted in the iron being retired and a new cat token introduced to the game. In, in 2017, Hasbro held an online vote to determine the future of some tokens. More than 4 million people voted. The results retired the boot, thimble, and wheelbarrow and added a penguin, rubber ducky, and T-Rex. Now, wasn't that a great story? I just enjoyed Monopoly so much and enjoyed playing it, and I hope you enjoyed this book. H happy reading.